Can I get you to turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy 30, 15 to 20? Deuteronomy 30, 15 to 20. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for these stories of, that point us to Jesus. All these figures in the Bible are to remind us that, that you are sending your son Jesus to die on the cross, to rise again and be our Savior, and take us to be in fellowship for all eternity with you. Lord, help us to remember that um, this is your story, and it will do us good to listen. In Jesus' name, amen. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God will, may bless you in the land which you are entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you do not obey, but have drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall sh surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land which you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death the blessings and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live in you and your descendants by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by holding fast to him. For this is your life in the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them. The name of this sermon today is it's chapter 6 in the, uh, the book, the story, and it's called The Long and Winding Road. And if you think about that, you're going to say, where do I remember the long and winding road? Well, the Beatles in the early 60s wrote a song, The Long and Winding Road. Now, I'm not a big fan of the Beatles, but they, they had a few good songs, and I like this one. And it's kind of a sad song. It, but it's very well written. I'm going to read you one verse. How many times I've been alone, and many times I've cried. Anyway, you'll never know how many times I've tried. It's about a man who's trying to win the love of a, of a girl, and it doesn't matter what he does. It seems to be, it, it's just around the other band, and it's not working for him. But the reason I brought this song up and named this sermon, The Long and Winding Road, is because the Bible is full of lots of stories where there's a long and winding road that's not their fault. If you remember, David was King Saul's best soldier, and King Saul got angry with him and, and jealous of him, and then he <coughs> went for years from place to place uh, running for his life. A long and winding road that he had, it wasn't his fault. And you remember Job, who faced all the difficulties in the book of Job, so that we have that book, so we learn things from it. But Job must have wondered, this is a long and winding road. People hate me, I've lost everything. What about Jeremiah, the weeping prophet? He weeped because it, it was so hard. And God says, you can't have a wife and you can't have a family because I have a job too hard for you to have anything like that. And there's lots of other ones. Paul, in the, in the New Testament, he got beaten up most every day. Well, not all, obviously not every day, but lots enough that you, you say, oh, not again. And Ruth and Naomi, what a hard road for them. It was a long and winding road for them, too. So this 
story is a long and winding road for Moses and for the people of Israel. And for Moses, he had to do all this work with these people. And for Israel, it shouldn't have been a long and winding road. It should have been Red Sea, Mount Sinai, get all that stuff together, and then go right into the land. No winding road. But I'm going to tell you my Service New Brunswick winding road story. Now, Service New Brunswick does good work, and I've been in there, and they've done everything right, and it's just been in and out. And I got my picture taken, which was not bad, actually, and I was surprised. Anyway, this particular time I went in, and I bought a car for $1,500, which I bought it at night, and it wasn't worth $1,500. I went in to the pay for it, and they said, Sir, it's going to be $750 registration for your $1,500 car. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I held my mouth. And they said, shut up and pay up. <laughs> and so I did. And I thought that was the end of it. But four months later, I got a terse curse, um, letter saying, you didn't pay enough on your registration, sir, poking me in the chest with the letter and you need to pay $5.87 and mail a check to the government or come into service to Roosevelt with the invoice. Well, they didn't include the invoice. So then I had to call service New Brunswick and it was a, a like 10 minutes wait and I hung up and 10 minutes because I'm at work and I got to work and eventually got through to somebody in Baktouche or, or Bathurst I think it was and they said, oh, yeah, sir, you're supposed to pay that. And I said, well, I never got the invoice. Oh, well, you give me an hour and I'll get that to you. And, and they called up an hour later and they said, we got it. Do you want us to mail it to you? And I said, no, we've already spent an hour each. This is an expensive. And so they faxed it to me and I went in and paid it. Now, we spent $150 getting this, huh. we spent $150 getting this, this fixed. Anyway, now, <clears throat> you see, it wasn't my fault, but I was responsible to fix it every step of the way. Just like Moses was responsible. There was lots of things that he didn't do and didn't, it wasn't his fault. Now, when I made this, uh, sermon up. I had it all ready and I practiced it twice and I said, this is really depressing. I don't even want to hear it and I made it up. And so I had to do it all over again because, so if you're, you're okay with this, I picked the happy parts and I'll tell the story and I'll just, just tell you the happy parts that I, where the hero in the story shows through. Now, it, it, this story is kind of like, I was listening to a sermon on hell, and really nobody wants to listen to a sermon on hell because it's not, it's not uplifting. This is, in a way, this is the same kind of deal. Well, Moses has worked really hard. He's got the people, he's got them to the Mount Sinai, he's gone up the, and got the Ten Commandments, and he come down and found out that they're, they're worshiping idols, like they shouldn't be doing that. And then he's got that straightened out, and they're building the tabernacle and all that stuff. And now they're complaining about the food. And this one last thing in verse chapter eleven, it says, verse four: the rebel, the rabble from among them, had greedy desires. And also the people, the sons of Israel, wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? Well, Moses said in verse 10, Now Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, every man at the doorway of the tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you been so hard on your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight? You have laid the burden of all these people on me. And he goes on to explain how hard this is. And then he says, 
in verse 15. So if you're going to deal thus with me, please kill me at once. <laughs> if I found favor in your, your sight, do not let me see my wretchedness. Poor Moses. Now, now you have to look at this. These are two complaints. One, the people are complaining about the, they don't have meat. And God is angry. But Moses complains and says, please kill me. And God answers in verse 16. And the Lord therefore said to Moses, gather for me 70 men from the elders of Israel. And then in 17 it says, then I'll come down and speak with you there. And I will put the spirit who is upon you and will put him upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you. So you not, will not bear it all alone. And so God went and looked after him right away. This was a, a, a legitimate complaint, and he said, I'll fix that for you, no problem. Now, he also is going to fix that problem of, of um, the meat. And he says, not only will they eat meat for one day and two days and a week and a month until it comes out their nose. And... and it's not that Moses doesn't believe God will do this. He wonders the logistics of it. How is this, how's this, what's the, where's the line going to form? If you've been, I'm, the cabana, sorry, cannabis store opened up, and they're struggling with the logistics of getting people in and out. I drove by Maple and Road on the way home from exercise on Thursday, and they were around the front of the building and around the side at 8.15. And they're standing in line outdoors because they only let a few in and two in to purchase at a time. And my understanding is about 8.30, they sent the security guard out and counted the people and said, these are the only ones that are going to get in. The rest of you might as well go home. And I'm going to stand here and send everybody else that shows up home because they're not going to get in. Well, see, Moses was kind of thinking this. Well, there's 600,000 men plus women and children. How are you going to arrange enough meat for them to eat? Well, God says, I love this. This is, what, uh, this is a great verse. The 23, the Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's power limited? Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. God is saying, look, so here's what he did. He sent quail. And the quail came in and they landed a day's walk from the middle of the camp in every direction. That's 20 miles is a day's walk. So there's a 40 mile circle of quail three feet deep. That's enough meat. There's no problem. That's lots. Well, they've got that fixed. The quail, they've eaten enough meat that it came out their nose. And now they're the next problem that poor Moses has to deal with. Now, you know that there's always a tipping point with people. It reaches a certain point that you, your complaints, which have been silent and you've kept them in your head, are all of a sudden are on your own loud voice part of your system. And in verse chapter 12, it says, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman he'd married. You see, they, they were mad at him, but they didn't say anything, and this was the tipping point. And they said in verse 2, How has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. I love that. And the Lord heard it. Now, you know that the Lord hears everything. The Lord knows everything. But this verse is kind of like a parent says, I heard that. And you know what it means. It doesn't just mean, oh, that was good information. That means you're going to get punished for that. And so God is mad. And he says a bunch. But he says at the end, in verse 8, with him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly, and not in dark sayings. And behold, the form of the Lord. He beholds the form of the Lord. Why then 
Were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? So the anger of the Lord burned against them, and he departed. And when he departed, there was a gift. He left. Well, Miriam was white with leprosy. And so Aaron had to come to Moses and say, Moses, please heal our sister. We're sorry. This was wrong of us to do this. <coughs> well, this shows me, it, it said in verse 3, which we skipped, now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. Now, if you go through this and you read all of this, you recognize that Moses, every time people did something against him, and now they were going to be punished because God saw that, Moses, his default position, the place he went to every time was, I want to protect, I want to help fix this problem. He pleads the case of the person that's wronged him every time. Well, these people had one job. The one job was to recognize that God was all-powerful, and he did what he said he was going to do. And so the year and a half or so is up. They've built the tabernacle. They have did all that stuff, and now they're at the promised land, and God sends 12, says to Moses, send 12 spies, one from every nation, every tribe, into the promised land, and scout it out. Well, when they came back, it didn't go well. It says in verse chapter 14 of verse 1, then all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And then all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And they said, wouldn't it be better if we stayed in Israel, stayed in Egypt, and not done all of this, because now we're going to die. And let's elect a new leader to take us back. Well, these are the heroes I want to point out. Joshua and Caleb said in verse 8, If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into the land that he, and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Well, that's a great rousing speech. You would think everyone would jump up and say, yes, we will do this. But that's not what they said. In verse 10 it says, But all the congregation said, Stone them with stones. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of the meeting to all the sons of Israel. This is another one of those verses where it says, The Lord, I heard that. And the Lord said to Moses in verse 11, How long will these people spurn me, and how long will they not believe in me, despite all the signs which I performed in their midst? I will smite them with pestilence, and dispossess them, and I will make you a nation <coughs> greater and mightier than they. So once again, God has said to Moses, I'm going to destroy these people, they're a pain in your neck, and, a, and I'm going to make you a great nation. And Moses spends the next few verses pleading with God, again, this humble man pleads with God to save them. And he says in verse 18, 19, Pardon, I pray, the iniquity of these people, according to your greatness of your loving kindness, just as you have all so have forgiven these people from Egypt even to now. So the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to your word. So Moses pleaded for them again, and God says, I have pardoned them according to your word. Now, you see, Moses had signed on for a year, year and a half, to get the people from the Red Sea to the Promised Land. And they're at the... But 
something has happened. And if you turn to verse 30 to 32, it says, Surely you shall not come into the land which I swore to sell to you, except Caleb and Joshua. Your children, however, whom you said will become a prey, I will bring them in, and they will know the land which you have rejected. As for you, your corpses will fall in the wilderness. See, this is the sad part. This is the part I, that I said, oh, dear, I don't want to preach that. You see, Moses now had the rest of the 40 years to look after these people. And the last part of the sermon is the, word, the last words of a humble man. Well, <coughs> something happened on the way. All the time, actually. They complain. They complain. But if you keep turning the pages of more and more complaints, you get to chapter 20. And, and verse 8. Well, they had no water. And they were complaining that they had no water. And if you remember earlier, there was a complaint that was no water. And Moses took his staff and hit the rock. But after that, one of the other complaints these other men would say, well, we're also all prophets of God and all important. And, and God had them all get together and he picked one tribe and one person. He came to Moses and Moses' staff flowered, grew flowers. And so they said, this is the staff. This represents Moses. This is my chosen person. You are to take that staff and you are to put it beside the ark so that you will always remember that if anyone ever says, is Moses our leader, well, go get the staff. It's the one with the flowers growing off of it. <coughs> well, <clears throat> in verse 8, it says, take the rod and you and your brother Aaron assemble this congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes and it will yield, may yield water. And then in verse 9 it says, So Moses took the rock from before the Lord, just as he has commanded him. Now, you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, you're telling me to just speak to the rock. But, now I got a, I, you told me to bring a rod in my hand. You, you, you're thinking to yourself, God should have said, listen, don't bring the rod, because these people are going to make you mad, and you might do something with it, and you're going to get in trouble. But God said, bring the rod. Now, why would he do that? Because after he hit the rock, it says, uh, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you, not, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I've given you. Now, think about this. Aaron was standing there. He had no part of it. Moses was the one that hit the rock, but now Aaron's being punished for it. And you think to yourself, well, why would God tell him to take the, the rod? Well, <clears throat> when a person becomes a new Christian, they do all sorts of things that they did before. The sins that they did before, they keep doing, and God kind of prunes them off a little at a time. You learn, oh, I shouldn't do that. And you stop. But Moses, he was God's spokesman. He was the one that saw God's form. He was the one that God spoke to, man, face to face. If he said, you're not to hit the rock, you're to speak to it, Moses should have done it. See, God holds us to an account of the, with the information we have, that's the, that's the, well, how we would be judged on it. Anyway, Mo Moses and Aaron don't get to go into the promised land. They spent 40 years bringing these people to it, and they're not going to get to go. So, do you remember what I read in the call to worship? His work is perfect, and all his ways are just. That's Moses' words. All his ways are just. He asked God a number of times, look, can you reconsider? And God said no, but God still was just. And so, in Deuteronomy 
31. That's the, you see, while, while all this was going on, Moses was writing these first five books of the Bible. He had that to do, too. And he wrote this down in verse 31, 26. He said, Take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may remain as a witness against you. For I know your rebellion and your stubbornness. Behold, while I was still alive with you today, you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more then after my death? Assemble to me all the elders of, the, of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their hearing, and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death you will act corruptly, and turn away from the way that I've commanded you, and evil will befall you in your later days. Well, when you read Joshua, which we will next week for next week, you will find out that Joshua says, at the end of his life, he has kind of a speech like this again. And he says, as for me and my, he says, choose yourself today what you will do. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And everyone said, we will too serve the Lord. And they did. They served the Lord. And it says at the end of Joshua that all the people that were alive, when Joshua did all these things, served the Lord faithfully. But the one thing that they didn't do was train their children. And once they had all died, their children left God. Well, I'm going to, you see, God in the upper story has come down repeatedly to do these things, to help Moses when he had a complaint. To punish the people when they had a, their complaint wasn't just. And he did this over and over again. And he said, I'm going to destroy them. And Moses got to talk God out of destroying them over and over again. But he allowed them to suffer the consequences. And that's why they spent 40 years in the desert. But they didn't, they weren't destroyed. Now Moses was the most humble man on earth until Jesus came. But this Moses was a picture of Jesus. He was their savior of these people over and over again. He put himself on the line for them. He offered to, he was offered time and time again to allow God to destroy them, but he said, no. If you will not go with us, I will not go. Now I'm going to tell you a story. Be, to end, there's a, this is a story from 1979, and there's a Mr. Williams, and he wanted to do what the people of Israel failed to do, and he wanted to train the next generation to worship God. And he, for his part, was a Sunday school teacher of a grade 8 class, not a grade 8, sorry, an 8 year old class, grade 3. And he wanted a few things. He got a new class in every, every September because kids grow up. And he wanted these boys and girls to be kind to each other, to learn to be just, to learn to be friendly, to learn all these things that God wants you to do. But most important, he wanted them to know that Jesus died and rose again and went to heaven to be our advocate, and he wanted the kids to learn that. And as the fall went by toward Christmas, these kids were getting together, and they were learning all of these things, but the most important thing they weren't getting. And it came up to Easter, and you remember I said it was 79. Well, in 1979, there was a company called Legs, L. E-G-G-S. They made pantyhose. And they made pantyhose in an egg-shaped container. And his wife bought these pantyhose. And he had empties. <coughs> because you don't throw stuff out. And, and so he said to each kid, I'm going to send you out in the yard. And you're to pick things that remind you of Easter. How God has saved us. How God is good to us. So the kids went out, and they got 
he gave them Easter eggs, and he said, you bring these in, and at the, we're going to open them together. So that's what they did. So they all put them on the table, and all the kids gathered around, and he said, I'm going to open them, and you tell me the story. And this was a leaf, and the little boy said, well, this leaf was last year's leaf, but it tells you that God provides renews. There's new leaves on the tree. And so he handed them back his, the egg. And he opened another one. And there's a little flower. And well, God makes things grow. And he opened another one. And there was moss in it. And the moss is so soft. And he said, God can make things grow. This this is off the roof. How can stuff grow on the roof? I have it all the time on my doorstep. It falls off the roof. But God can make things grow in impossible places. And, and one had berries, red berries, and it said, he said, that, those represent Jesus' blood. We died on the cross for us. And this one was quite heavy. It's a rock. And he's, how does that, what's that? Well, the little boy says, well, I knew everybody was going to have put a flower or something. So I put a rock as a joke. Because they're eight-year-old boys, you know? Well, there was one boy in this group that, that people were kind to, but they never in, he was always outside the group because he had Down syndrome. Anyway, it came to the time to open his egg. It was empty. And the kid says, how come you didn't do what you were told? How come you didn't put anything in your egg? That's dumb. And he says, no, no. This represents Easter. Best of all, because the tomb is empty. God's body is not in the tomb, it's gone. It's, he's gone to heaven, he's there for us. This is the story of Easter. And everyone stopped talking. And it got really quiet. And the kids recognized that the little boy was the smartest little boy in this. He figured it out. And, the, and the, the, Mr. Williams was really happy because Finally, someone had figured out know, <coughs> that Jesus came and died and rose again, and he's not, in the, he's not in the tomb. And so the boys and girls hugged him. They embraced him figuratively and literally. And he became part of the group. And he, was, and he had a wonderful time in Sunday school through the rest of the spring and into the summer, but he wasn't a healthy little boy, and he died. He died. And all of the little children, they had the sermon at, at the church, the grave, his casket was up front, and all the little boys and girls brought their eggs from home. And they stood up front and they showed everybody that it was empty. And then they put them in his casket because he wasn't there anymore. He was gone to be with the Lord. The shell was empty. You see, all of these stories, the stories we talk about Moses, they all point us to Jesus. Jesus is, the, is what we need to know, that Jesus came, he died and rose again. He's our Savior. Moses only saved them temporarily. But Jesus saves us for all eternity. Amen. He's the one who will take our broken, sinful heart and make it anew. He's our Savior. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for that the tomb is empty. That you have brought, risen again and, and the little Down syndrome boy is in heaven with you because he recognized that you came to save us from our sins. You rose again as a guarantee and a, that we if we're in your heart, in your hands, you will save us. 
We have to understand that you are strong enough to do anything, and you do what you promised, and you promised to come and save us, Lord. Be with us now. We will recognize that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn in our...